It's not too hot, but it's warm. And we're here to praise God and to know that God loves us. So let's start by sharing that love with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name When the sun's shining down on me When the world's all as it should 
should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. On the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. My God will conquer the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. 
Take me as you find me All my fears and failures Fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender Yes, yes I surrender Jesus conquer the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, he can He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. When I'm running the clicker, I can't run my mind at the same time. Thank you all for being here this morning. This summer, I wonder why it is, the summer when we talk about being disciples and following Jesus' way, we kind of thin out. It actually happened to Jesus a fair amount too. There's that passage where it says, and many left him, but you have not. And so the summer, as we follow this pattern of trying to learn how to be a follower of Jesus, we recognize that it's different from being a fan or a, of a team or a star. It's different from idle curiosity or even admiration. It involves our complete commitment to the life which Jesus is the model, a life that frankly runs counter to the cultural norms our social alignments, and the convenient points of safety in society. And we hear Jesus today making warnings about the trouble that comes from being a follower. And encouraging us to face those without fear. How does that strike you as we hear the gospel read? Thank you, Josh. Gospel reading, Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are still counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, 
I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. I know Methodists don't like old German hymns, but that's one of my favorites. Thank you for singing it this morning. Have you ever noticed that some of the most seemingly fearless folks are those who are actually defending what they regard as the status quo? The majority rights against the minority. Somehow we find great courage when we think we're part of a bigger group or at least a group with ancient roots, a group with power over others, either legally or because our social structure seems to grant implicit power. We know from the Bible that those who threw stones at the woman caught in adultery were those just, quote, enforcing the dominant group's power to regulate the sexual property right. Jews found courage in oppressing Samaritans. The Romans and their allies were quite confident and content to lord it over the peasants. 
In our own setting, who seems to have courage to act fiercely to those on the outside, those who attack Muslims in our country, those who attack Jews, those who do not hesitate to shoot black men in a context where they would not shoot a white man, those who are willing to make the rich richer while seeing the burdens on the poor raised, those who think nothing of stealing land from the Native Americans still. The list goes on. But those of us who are not involved in, the, in notorious actions are likely to also find courage with the powerful and the well-positioned in our own ways. There's a cascading effect where this courage kind of ripples down through the social and economic order. We may find ourselves sniping at a poor person who asks for help. We might try to exclude people who have mental illnesses. We may simply not engage with people who are of a different color, ethnicity, sexual identity, and the like. In our small ways, we, per we peck at others we perceive to be our inferiors. Like, it's like being pecked to death by a duck. I, I love that phrase. But there's an experience that we, we have if we are those who are being hurt. And even our children find that we bully those who are different at school, in sports, and in our neighborhoods. And the Christian church, of course, has practiced this kind of courage a lot. We had the Crusades, the Inquisitions, the excommunications, the witch trials. We use segregation in our churches to keep out others. Few churches today are racially integrated and socially inclusive. The whitest hour of the week is Sunday morning, right? When people are in church. We've used our religion to oppress people who marry across racial lines, who've been divorced, who marry people of the same gender, or simply take public stands with which we disapprove. But this is not the sort of courage and fearlessness that Jesus exhibited, nor what is, it, is it what he calls us to live. He does not take the holier-than-thou attitude toward others, even though he could. But as it's written in the ancient hymn in Philippians 2, he did not see equality with God something to be sought after. That is, Jesus rejected the role of defender of the powers and hotshots and bigwigs, and he took the role of the servant and the slave, the outsider, the underdog, to the point of an ignominious death on the cross. Jesus exhibited courage the courage of one who comes down to the lowest level that society has created and stands in solidarity with the marginal and the outsiders. That's true courage and fearlessness that's grounded in trust of God, trust in God. So how do we measure up? I'm pretty sure most of us would feel pretty uncomfortable if we did that all the time. But we don't need to lose hope because Jesus teaches us how and empowers us to follow him. The first thing he tells us is we should not claim rank greater than Jesus, the suffering servant of God, but seek to live as he did. Now, how many Methodist churches do you know that have a great big sign with the, at the best parking spot that says, reserved for pastor. I've been at that church, been at several of those churches. We don't have any parking, so hey. But we all practice this. We all can get up just a little higher than the next person, right? We can all put ourselves on a bit of a pedestal in relationship to other people. But Jesus invites us, just don't claim it. You may make a lot of money. You may have a fancy job or high social status or education. Don't use that as your means of interacting with people. 
And in so many cases, we have white, middle-class American privilege. Now look, I don't think anybody in this room is going to be a member of the KKK or do something that's really overtly racist, but most of us, you know, are repelled by that. But here, there are two ways in which race continues to play a role in our lives that we can all change. Number one, consider what it's like for a guy like me, a white, educated, middle-class old guy, to walk into a bank or an insurance agency or the post office or a store. I expect to be treated a certain way. And often I am. But you can be sure that if somebody was a black man, not, too, not older, but not dressed too well even, who walked into those places, he would be treated differently. And I recently saw a rather well-known lawyer who told the story of going into a court in a town where he wasn't usually practicing and going and sitting down at council table and being yelled at by the judge and told to get out in the hall and wait till council came. This is a middle-aged, well-dressed, African-American lawyer. And he said, excuse me, uh, I am the lawyer. Oh, ha, ha. This is how race works in America, and all of us are affected by it. It doesn't mean that we go out to be, you know, nasty to people of color. It's just that we as who are white benefit from a system that does this. And I, as a white guy, kind of expect it. The second thing is... how the wealth of our country is divided up. And I want to just highlight one important piece of history. I was born in <clears throat> the 50s, okay? And some of you were born in the 50s, some of you were born in the 40s. Many of us had parents who were GIs, who came back from World War II, maybe Korea, and um, maybe our parents didn't grow up rich, but the GI Bill gave uh, those parents a mortgage at a, at a good rate, education that, could be, that the government would pay for, and a number of other GI Bills that transformed America. So people who didn't have a pot, literally, were able to build up equity and they could send their children to college and get better educations and they had equity so that they could have retirements and the whole economic structure was designed to help us get ahead. But I bet you didn't know that African Americans were consistently excluded from many of those benefits in many places in our country. So today, two and three generations out, they're disadvantaged. Now, we didn't do that to them, but we are benefiting from a system that does that. And so, we can ignore these realities or we can decide that it's our job to be like Jesus and to say we want to stand with people who have been excluded and we want to assert their rights and their ability to receive as though the game wasn't rigged. We're supposed to take the posture of the least of these, but we really haven't done so. And when I came here, I was so happy that this church had said that the motto of this church was to be Matthew 25, 31 to 40, which is the sheep and the goat story, right? Where Jesus tells the disciples, he says, these are the people who are already following him. He says, if you want to be known as my disciples, this is what you, how you live. 
You feed the hungry, you give drink to the thirsty, you give clothing to those who are without clothing, you visit those who are sick, and you visit those who are in prison. You do these things. And this church is making great headway in this. Now Jesus knows that this is a messy business and it will irritate people. It will make people angry. He says, don't be afraid of the persecution and the troubles. Trust in God. And we say, but what about our families and our close connections and the people we know in our workplaces? What will they say if we speak out for people of color, the poor, convicts, addicts, athletes who kneel during the national anthem, and those who have outlandish political views? What will our relatives say? I have relatives who are were pretty overtly nasty about people of color. It was hard to be around them. He says that our families will not always, you know, work. Because a family is sort of a natural group of people and you, you learn to live with one another because you're related. And he says, but if you choose to follow me, there are going to be some fault lines here. There are going to be some differences. There are going to be issues where you might have to say, no, I don't think we're going to use that N-word anymore at this house. You might have to say, no, we're not going to put poor people down just because they're poor. We're not going to stereotype these people or those people. And it may not be popular. But if we fearlessly love as Jesus loved, if we follow the model in Jesus of the suffering servant living with the marginal, practicing loving as he loves, then we can love, we can do it because we know we're not alone, that God walks with us. And we can love the people who are critical. Okay? We can love people who don't get it. We can love people who don't like how we're living. And in that, we're not making the, the world a worse place, but we're building bridges to people who are on one side and people on the other, as Jesus did when he stretched out his arms on the cross. Amen.
Let us lift up to the Lord our sins. All the ways in which we have not been faithful disciples. Many just unintentional, others intentional. Guide us to offer ourselves back to Jesus, that he might cleanse our hearts and restore us in his service. Now, friends, that uh, those sins we lift up in the name of Jesus are truly forgiven. Know in the name of Jesus that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Jesus invites everybody to his table, everyone who seeks to be at peace with God and with others, or everyone is welcome. After our prayers together, you're welcome to come forward and kneel or stand as you wish to receive. If you need gluten-free, it's on this side, just ask for it. This is just a simple meal that Jesus took and said, Look, even in this simple food, I am with you. So when you taste it, know that I am with you, that I love you, that you are not alone. No matter who you are, a thief on a cross, a lonely person, someone who doubts, someone who is sure, Someone who's angry, someone who is confused. He is here for all of us. May the Lord be with you. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Oh, it is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away, our love failed. Your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets who looked for the day when justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time has come when you will save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners, and by the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection has given birth to your church, delivering us from slavery to sin and death and making with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. Now on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and he gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here 
And on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at that heavenly banquet. All this we lift up through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is the Lamb of God who gives us hope and peace and life. things are ready. Please come forward.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, go out and show love. Know that you're loved by God and show love to all people and be filled with the peace of God. Amen.